What's going on, everybody? I am doing a, another interview video today. Um, today I'm joined here with Chris. Um, he has lived abroad and has taught English, um, you know, in Russia, which is a country that many of you guys may know I'm very interested in, in being in in the future. And uh, I wanted to ask him some questions regarding his um, experience, you know, traveling and living abroad and uh, how that's been for him. So, Chris, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, it's really it's really great to talk to someone who's interested in Russia. I really, you know, have, have spent a lot of time over there, so I'm always happy to talk about it, especially with someone who's as enthusiastic as you, who has yeah. a, a bottle of Ruski Standard in the oh, back. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> I got it right here, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about uh, that. So, uh, yeah, it sounds like fun. Let's, let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, obviously, uh, I, I told Chris initially like, when, when I set up the interview, I told him, hey, you know, I've um, done interviews with other travel YouTubers. Um, you know, I've lived abroad personally in Vietnam for a little bit and taught English out there. Um, and, you know, Asia is one of my favorite places to be in the world. But, you know, ever since I got back and even before when I traveled to Asia, Russia has always been um, such a mystery to me. And, you know, there's so much mystery that surrounds Russia that, you know, a lot of Americans don't know too much about how the country is, the culture is out there. They just think of Russia as vodka drinkers and bears on unicycles and all that stereotypical stuff. Or they think of the Cold War specifically. So, yeah. Um, I wanted to maybe ask you, for example, uh, first of all, you know, um, just to kind of get into the meat and potatoes of it, with regards to qualifications in Russia, when I looked up, you know, what is required in order to teach out in Russia, almost every dig almost every um, article that I ran into or any YouTube video, even though there's still a lack of information, I I've noticed it's hard for me to get like, like just straightforward information on what do you need to teach in Russia. Many articles state that you don't even need to have a degree that you need your TEFL certification to teach out there. And they say if you have a degree, however, you can get, you know, right into like public schools and whatnot. Uh, China used to be the same way, although China has now been a lot more strict um, with their requirements yeah. over the years. How has Russia uh, been over the years? Are they still pretty loosened up in terms of um, qualifications that you need to teach out there at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's pretty open. Uh, the government doesn't really say that somebody has to have certain uh, qualifications. So it comes down to being the schools or the organization's um, preference, really. And so since I uh, just, I guess anyone who's watching would want to know, you know, who the heck is this guy? and What does he know about it? Um, so I lived in Russia for eight years. I did the first year teaching English at a language school there. So I had experience with being hired by a company and being sponsored on their visa. And that, you know, I found very quickly that it felt more like a hostage situation where it's like uh, you're either going to do what we want you to do, whether that be overtime, or whether that be, um, you know, things that weren't in the contract up front. And if you don't do them, then, of course, we sponsor your visa. So we're going to hold that over your head the whole time. I didn't really like that feeling. And that's really one of the main motivating factors that mm. pushed me to open up my own school the next year. Mm. And so um, I had a school over there for about seven years and we closed in November of last year, which I'm so happy we did because coronavirus hit oh, just a few months later. Of course. So, um, so I was really lucky to dodge that bullet. But, uh, but you know, when I'm speaking today, I'll be speaking from the point of view of a person who actually did hire other people to come and work there and gave them visas. And, um, and so I do know a little bit about how that has worked up to this point, you know, maybe after coronavirus, it'll change, but uh, I'll try to bring that perspective. So as far as qualifications, like for my personal school, I hired people who had qualifications and people who didn't, because at the end of the day, um, you know, demand is going to drive how the business performs. And so the owners or, or directors of the business there are going to be looking for people who fit into certain stereotypes. And that's they want like the, the classic uh, British or American yeah. or other English speakers and, uh, and the qualifications become less important and and charm becomes more important and of course. Uh, personability becomes more important. Yeah, you know, I've kind of noticed that, too, um, especially now knowing how strict China's become, though, over the last few years. 
their demand is so much higher than even Russia's if you think about their population differential. I mean, yeah. lo- listen, China is is at the all is at an all time high in terms of demand, especially after coronavirus is over. Whenever they open these schools back up, they're going to need so many English teachers. But because of how difficult it is, you know, that you need your degree notarized um, and and all this stuff prior to even going to China and all the endless amount of paperwork back in uh, back in the day in China, you would be able to just go abroad and just have your TEFL certification. Seemingly like you could do in Russia right now, um, and that was usually good enough because you had qualification to at least you know teach the basics. Even if you're not going to teach at a higher level education, you're able to. But now that seems like you can't do that anymore in China, and I think that's going to create some problems in the future. So um, I have to say kudos to Russia for still being able to you know understand they have a demand, and as long as they have someone who is still certified to do what they need to do, you know, uh, the example with their TEFL certification, which that's all I needed technically in Vietnam. Although they have gotten a little bit more strict in the last year too, um, with degree yeah. requirements, but you can still find plenty of private jobs, and I'm sure you could still do it in China, but you would need to be under a certain visa, you know, or else right. you wouldn't be teaching legally. Um, what kind of um, what kind of visa do you usually suggest for somebody to get? Say if they don't have their degree, like if they're in my shoes, for example, they have a TEFL certification, they still want to teach in Russia. And, um, what kind of what kind of visa do they need, and how long will that visa last, and can it be renewed? Yeah, great. Um, so let's kind of let's kind of break it down into the big businesses. Like we, there's Language Link, or there's other big schools like English First, who have offices in most large cities in Russia, and they're going to play by different rules than than the smaller local language schools. And so those big guys, I call them kind of like the McDonald's of of teaching English in Russia, because um, they will usually require you to have a four-year degree. They're going to require you to have at least a TEFL. They'll prefer CELTA. And they're going to more or less do things the legal way. Um, however, they're also going to just, just try to squeeze every drop of energy out of you. So of um, that, that can really suck working in that environment. That's where I went when I worked for that first year. Um, however, the smaller schools who don't really care about qualifications, they just need to get a native speaker into their school. And and also it's a little riskier. So uh, the, the visa that you're looking for is called a work visa, Robochai visa. And you remember this is before coronavirus for, for however many years, but mm-hmm. you don't actually get this kind of visa before you go to Russia. You actually have to come on a certain type of business visa and then get it changed once you're there. And there are some really interesting things that happen because the company has like um, about three months to change its mind, to say that they don't want to transfer you to the the real work visa because the work visa that's issued in the United States or the home country that you are traveling from, that's like enough to get you into the country, but for you to stay, that thing will have to be renewed to one that was issued while being in Russia. And that's only issued after after your company goes back and applies for it with, Um, a negative HIV test mm. that gets done when you're in Russia at a Russian hospital. So, wow. uh, yeah, so, so there are some, some little steps that most people don't really know about. Um, and, uh, and that can be both an opportunity and a risk. And I have some, some stories about risk, risky situations, you know, just like in Ch- it's, it's right to compare it to China because um, the same way someone might promise, hey, I'm going to give you a work visa later and you get there. And then in a month, they're just like, OK, we're, we're done with you. And then they don't care what happens to you next. And yep. it's really a terrible position to be in. So you don't want to go on a tourist visa. You don't want to go on um, a student visa, uh, although according to the law, again, as of last November, as of a year ago, um, you, it was legal to work on a student visa mm-hmm. in a language school. But, uh, but what you really want is the work visa. And that's, that's, uh, that's for a few reasons. But the, the first one, of course, it's legal and that's the way you're supposed to do it. But the main reason is you can pretty much stay in Russia forever with a work visa. Mm-hmm. You never have to get a green card. You never have to get, a, get citizenship. Um, you can stay there really forever by just renewing this work visa every year. You can come and go as you please. Mm. Uh, this gives you complete access and freedom 
to be in Russia. Of course, if another company sponsors your visa, then you have to continue to be employed by them. If you go okay. and switch employment and someone else sponsors your new visa, then you have to leave the country, get the new visa and come back. Um, but in my situation, for example, it gave me so much freedom because I didn't have to go take any tests and, and get some kind of documents um, because I started my own business. So I issued myself the work visa Interesting. And then every year I renewed my work visa. So I was able to sponsor myself being in the country, basically. That's cool. Um, do you have any personal plans on going back out to you know, reopen your school again after this whole pandemic is over? Or are you okay where you are right now? I am so happy that I closed that thing yeah. because uh, I see online business as the way of the future. We opened, uh, we went online completely about a year and a half before we closed down the offline school. And uh, at the point when we closed it down, it wasn't because we, you know, we're, we're like clairvoyant and we saw coronavirus coming. It was because um, it was because online was making way more than offline and offline had so many expenses. And so like, I would never, looking back, I would never want to go back into that position. And, mm -hmm. and anyways, you're earning rubles. If you're coming from the UK or the, or the US or most, of these English speaking countries or Western countries, then the economy is probably going to be better in your home country. And it's much better to earn in that currency. Yeah. I've noticed there's kind of a correlation to with countries that, you know, are, you know, uh, where their government pays a lot less money, how much easier it usually is to get into a teaching position too. I know Russia is notorious for really not paying too well because of how yeah. their economy is. And, you know, the government is who's making the most money there. And that's obviously left a lot of Russians in a tough situation. Um, with the exception, obviously, of the two main cities, uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, I believe you were living in St. Petersburg. Is that correct? Uh, I was living in Yekaterinburg. Oh, okay. Never which mind. Which is the, the capital of the Ural region. Oh, I see. Okay. So, um, so, Tigavari uh, Spoluski, da? Da, can you that, see? Okay, good. Now, I wanted to ask that because how important is that when it comes to living in Russia and, and you know, teaching English? Is that something that you feel like you should at least have a little bit of knowledge going into or should you really get yourself involved with learning Russian or how important is that prior to teaching? Um, you should learn the alphabet before you go to Russia. Okay, that's fair. Uh, when you get to Russia, you'll find that the less Russian you know, if you don't know much Russian, that can also be an advantage because you're going to be the token American guy mm. and people want to have you around. And, yeah. um, and the fact that you don't speak any Russian, people are just amazed and shocked. And, and there's all kind of funny situations that uh, that can come up because people are making jokes. You don't understand. It has to be translated. Somebody has to practice translating. So they view it as like they're practicing their English skills. So you're just like a walking, talking language school. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, so, I wanted to top, touch up on that real quick. So I didn't interrupt. I was, I was going to say, though, w specifically being an American and living in Russia, because, you know, other native foreigners, live there, like from Australia or Canada or from other countries, but specifically being an American in Russia, how do they treat you as as a foreigner living in their country? What is your experience with great respect and friendliness? Wow. That's great. Um, with maybe an exception of people who are your boss who need to squeeze every every piece every little drop of energy out of you yeah um but but ra random people usual people <clears throat> i mean i i was there for eight years so i had a couple situations where people felt differently but um of course but for the most part i just everywhere i went people w were so uh hospitable so nice and you know it was in the beginning it was really shocking and then in the end i think I, it rubbed off on me and i tried to take some of those characteristics of russian people back with me and make them part of who i was so uh, i really i really love russia and, and respect russian people and here in the states a lot of my friends are russian too now wow i can almost hear kind of the russian accent kind of coming from you a little bit too man after <laughs> after all the years of being there i was gonna say you know because um, I'm glad that you mentioned the hospi uh, hospitality and, you know, the friendliness of the people, because I've noticed the same thing talking to people online. Obviously, I know a little bit of Russian, so clearly I've had some experience, you know, talking to them. Because I think if you think of most Americans, what we think about Russians, they might think, oh, man, they're probably mean. They 
you know, just always, you know, drunk or whatever the case might be. Um, and it's just not the, the truth at all. Obviously, there's going to be hardcore people from any country. I think I've met more friendly Russians than I've met any friendly Americans, you know. Uh, I, I think, think, so too. I think yeah. a lot of people in the U.S. are very rude, actually. So when I talk to people from Russia, I just notice their curiosity and our culture is fascinating, yeah. you know. We don't yeah. really ever take the time to to be like oh wow you're from russia you can you you know teach me a little bit because we just don't care really but exactly. whenever i'm speaking to russians they're like wow you're from america they're, and you know they start talking to you and they want help with their english and whatnot and so you know usually i've been off on this course of uh, you know helping them with their english and they've helped me with my russian so it's been a really nice exchange and they're just very friendly and like you said hospitable people they always want to teach you new things they taught me about their food their culture, their music and whatnot. And uh, it's been really, really nice. Um, Discord, yeah, by awesome. the way, is a really good app to use for, you know, language teaching also. Um, mm -hmm. You can join Russian servers and you can, um, you know, learn Russian that way. And that's how I've done a lot of it. So um, that's really awesome though, man. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, I think it's great that you brought that up because a lot of people in the West, in Western countries are misled by yeah. the lack of smiling of Russians. and. Yeah. Um, and that's not like when I'm saying be friendly, I'm not, I don't mean really be friendly in the American kind of way where like smile, Hey, how's it going to your neighbor? But then if you really needed something, would they actually help you? Uh, you know, it, and in Russia, it's kind of the other, the other way they're going to, they're going to help you and then tell you that you're an idiot for being in that situation. Yeah. Uh, which, which is really nice that somebody helped you. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a it's a different mentality definitely to get used to um and about drinking it's really funny too that this stereotype because um in the last five years or so there's been this huge movement in russia to be healthier and um and they have some different stereotypes about drinking than we do in the states and a lot of other countries um so like uh, sometimes you'll run into a person who who doesn't drink and then when you say that you drink they'll say oh are you an alcoholic like they'll take it to the extreme or, um, yeah. but there's this movement in the last five years of especially young people, they call it uh, it means the healthy, healthy way of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so like people will tell you this, they'll call it Zosh. Zosh. Z -O -Z. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like, um, these people don't smoke, don't drink. They work out a lot. Uh, like they go to the gym, they walk, run, and they're all about doing things that are not drinking. Of course. Yeah. Um, I will say this though, that, you know, the drink, I think a lot of the drinking stereotype too comes from some of these Eastern European countries and, and, uh, and in Russia for, you know, more poor areas where, you know, where money's not really coming in and there's not really a source of entertainment. I've noticed that there's a pretty good correlation with, no entertainment equals more drinking to kind of fill their fulfill their entertainment needs. Um, how many different places have you been to Russia? I assume you've obviously been to Moscow, St. Petersburg, the major cities. And I, have you been out to like the super rural areas of Russia? And what kind of like differences have you noticed, like traveling through different parts of the country? Yeah. Yeah. The, the two capitals, <laughs> Moscow and St. Petersburg, are uh, where a lot of people go. And, yeah. and even Russian people will tell you Moscow is not Russian. Uh, and St. Petersburg is the cultural capital. Yeah. And so outside of that, you have like real Russia. And then, um, and then you have some, some areas like, you know, the border of China, then this is a lot different culturally than, than other parts. And the South, like the Caucasus region is a lot different. So, um, so yeah, I've had the opportunity to go to a lot of these places. Like right now, um, I go to Sochi every year because mm -hmm. my parent-in-law, I have a Russian wife, we met in Yekaterinburg and, uh, and her parents moved from Yekaterinburg to Sochi. So I go to Sochi every year and see them and the culture there is so much different. It's more like you're in Dagestan or even like Armenia or yeah. it's, it's, it feels very different there than in a lot of other places. Um, I've also been to Volgograd and Saratov and both mm -hmm. of those places are also like the the, the more south west you go uh it kind of gets more like this like closer to the caucuses kind of culture um whereas over uh let's see then we have ufa 
which is the capital of the region called Bashkortostan. Mm -hmm. And above that is the region that's called Tatarstan mm -hmm. and the capital's Kazan. And both of those places are, um, you know, they're predominantly Muslim population and they have another language that they speak, this Tatar and Bash Bashkortis uh, <clears throat> language. And they're Turkic languages. So they sound a lot different. And, um, and those places are really cool. I really like Kazan. It's like one of the coolest cities that I've been to. It has like a historical area and a new area. And um, so I definitely recommend that as like another city to put on everybody's list. Uh, Tumin. Tumin is a four hours by car east of Yekaterinburg. And so now we're getting more into Siberia. Um, and so, so, you know, there's Ur the Ural region and then there's Siberia and then there's like Eastern Siberia, yeah. um, far East. And uh, so Tumin, this is a lot more rural, rural and, but, but also it's interesting that the colder regions are more influenced by oil culture. So you have a lot of the men who they will leave and go up North to an oil city for, for a month or two months, they'll make three, four times as much as most people make in a month. And then they'll come back and a lot of them will just party for like a week or two weeks straight and just yeah. spend all their money and have a fun time and then go back up. And wow. um, yeah, so, so it's, it's really interesting to meet some of those people who are doing that. Um, but yeah, th there's definitely big differences between, between the urban areas and the rural areas. But compared to the United States, you know, more, more people live in the urban areas than the rural areas. And so it's like everybody's dream to go to the city. If you're in the city, then then you're in civilization. Whereas in the States, the suburbs are kind of like this. It's, you know, we have city culture in big cities. And then if you're in a city that's, you know, less than a million people, then, uh, then the city is kind of empty a lot of days. And mm -hmm. you have just people living in all the suburbs around it, right? So Russia is definitely structured differently than that. Less people live in uh, separate houses and most people live in apartments. That's also something different to get used to. Um, yeah. And, and the way people speak is different too in the cities and in the country. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I know. we got a few minutes left. I kind of wanted to touch upon that too real quick that... Yeah, we can go as long as you as long as you want, man. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I was going to say though, you know, touching upon that, you know, with regards to... Um, you know, just the size of the country alone, it's important that you bring up the point that there's so much, you know, culture that kind of goes into the country that, you know, people just think, you know, most of Russia is just these Caucasian, you know, Russian speakers, you know, whatever from the, from these big cities. Cause most people, at least here in the U S I can say from people I talk to about Russia, like, you know anything about Russia? Yeah. They just drink vodka. They live in Moscow. You know, they're all these Caucasian people. And it's like, no, there's actually so much diversity. And you were talking about different dialects and even languages in parts of Russia. Yeah. And you have to think of the enormity, enormity of the country too, um, which is a really important um, part to mention. Um, I was going to say with regards to, you know, treatment, especially as a foreigner, do you get a huge difference being in a more rural, you know, town or city than you would say in Moscow or St. Petersburg in terms of how interested people are and like, wow, this guy's in our town speaking English. You said in general, people are already amazed that there's like some foreigner living in their, in their yeah. country or up. But you notice a bigger difference when you're out in these rural parts? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. When you're, if you go to Moscow or St. If you go to Moscow it, as a foreigner, it's just like, oh, another foreigner, get out of here. If yeah. you're in St. Petersburg, then maybe it's like, oh, a foreigner, okay. But everywhere else, it's like, oh my God, <laughs> he doesn't speak Russian. What? Where is he from? Yeah. And and they're really interested. And and you have to because the mentality is different. You have to understand that uh, they're very direct, and a lot of times mm -hmm. it comes across as rude. It comes China's the as same rude. way too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say that. Um, oh man, I forgot. I was gonna say that. Um, yeah. Do you, do you feel like you get special treatment over other people when you're in those more rural towns and you're talking to people, or do you feel like you still get to blend in? They're just kind of surprised you're a foreigner or do you, do they treat you completely different from other people? It can, I'd say that for the most part, people treat you differently Yeah. and that can be differently in the way that you get special treatment and def differently in the way that you get targeted. You of know? course. Uh, so 
it's better to blend in. It's better to try to blend in if you can. And yeah. With a lot of, you know, people in Russia being like Caucasian or whatever, and us being Caucasian too, we probably would blend in more initially than obviously if we lived somewhere like in China where everybody's obviously Asian and you're obviously going to stand out or whatnot. Um, yeah. I, so people probably wouldn't even really know if you were Russian or not until you actually spoke to them usually, right? Do you have people that will come up to you and just speak Russian immediately, even though they didn't know you were American at first or? Um you know, in the beginning, that didn't happen very often because the clothes I wore were clearly not Russian. Oh, okay. That's uh, true. The style, you know, the, the style of clothes. And there's some like um, conventions of how you dress when you go to certain places in Russia. Like if you go to, uh, if you want to go to a nightclub or a nice bar, which young Russian people will want to show you, uh, if you go there in tennis shoes, then they're not going to let you in. Wow. Okay. There's a strict dress code and the dress code doesn't mean that it has to be like, it's not the same dress code as here mm -hmm. in, in the States I'm talking about, but you just have to wear some black shoes that are not sporty. Mm. They can't be sporty. No tennis uh, shoes You have all. to wear, you can wear night, you can wear jeans if they're not ripped, but nobody wears khakis. Um, you can wear some like nice suit pants or something, but they shouldn't be baggy. Uh, you can wear a t-shirt and a suit jacket like this and you can go somewhere and, and that's like semi-formal. Whereas in the States, you basically have to wear a collared shirt if you wanna be formal or semi-formal. Uh, so like the, the convention of dressing, it takes some getting used to if you want to always get in without people giving you shit at the door. Yeah, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Because like, it's, it's embarrassing when you go with a group of people and you're and they're like, okay, you can go in. You can oh, this guy he can't go in. And then all your Russian friends have to fight for you and be like, no, 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 he he's not from around here. He's American. He just doesn't know. <laughs> and then they're like, fine, I'll let you in. And and you know that happened. I saw that happen to so many teachers who came over there because they and it was funny because they would stick to their guns. They'd be like, no, I'm I'm dressed fine. Like I'm you know what I mean. Like like mm -hmm. in the states, it's like uh, it doesn't matter what the person's wearing. They can go to pretty much any kind of business. But over there, you have to be dressed appropriately if you want to get into some places. Actually, that's kind of interesting. And I kind of want to relate that to something that obviously I know you, you, met, you mentioned that you met your wife in, um, you said Sochi? Is that right? In Yekaterinburg. Oh, yeah. Okay, right. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask that with regards to going to clubs and stuff, you know, I'm sure people are always interested on, on dating aspects to um, what it's like dating a woman from, from a foreign country, particularly Russia, because from my experience, when I talk to Russian women, they're very conventional, very standard, actually is very, almost kind of refreshing, you know, compared to, to talking to the girls here from the States where it's very kind of unconventional, I'm not saying there's not women like that in Russia, obviously that just want to have fun or whatever. And that's fine. But what has your experience been like with dating specifically in Russia? How to particularly mentioning that, you know, because you're American being a foreigner, yeah. how is that, yeah. you know, related to dating there? It's uh, so it's one of the topics that I bring up the most often in my, in my classes, if I have Russian people, because mm -hmm. the topic of gender roles, yeah. uh, Russia has very traditional gender roles and it, and young people are, are kind of becoming more westernized. So it's, it's becoming less and less like this, but it's still ingrained in them. So yeah. um, I remember the situation, I was introducing one guy from New York to this, this Russian girl mm -hmm. and, uh, and they start talking, whatever, she doesn't speak English, he speaks some Russian. So they're, ch they're chatting and stuff. He comes up with this question to ask her. He asks her something about, um, about if something is true about a Russian prison. And she was just shocked. She just looked at him and she said that she said, I'm a, I'm a girl. Wow. I don't know anything about prisons. Wow. Like, I'm a girl. Like, why would you ask me that? She was like offended that, and, and that's kind of, I, I like to tell that story because it really shows the, like how people adhere to the gender roles mm -hmm. there that um, you're supposed to play your part. You're supposed to be all of the things that a man should be traditionally in Russia and and a woman should be all of those things too and and the fact that you are them is not bad i had i had many girls in russia tell me remember this is their view not mine many girls in russia told me that women are women are capricious like women change their mind all the time um women aren't as smart that women are weak and they they identify these things as 
pluses. And, uh, and the men agreed. The men would, would characterize women the same way and, and women would characterize men the same way. They'd be like stubborn, you know, strong, big, has to have money. Uh, on, the, on the topic of money, it was, it was like a 95% agreement in all of my Russian groups that I taught that um, what a woman earns, she spends on herself and what a man earns, he spends on all of the family, mm. including the woman, including the wife. Um, so it was like, he's supposed to earn enough for everyone in our family and whatever she earns is just a plus that she can go and spend on herself. So these are just some examples of uh, like common opinions that I heard there that were kind of controversial to me at first because, because I knew in the States people would, would really strongly argue against them. Um, but date, but to get to your point, uh, to your question, dating, I, I would highly recommend that uh, if that's not really what you're looking for, if you're not <clears throat> really like ready to accept those traditional gender roles 100%, then find a girl or, or guy who has uh, like a Western mentality, who has some experience traveling abroad, who has, who has some knowledge of of like why it doesn't have to strictly be the way that it is in Russia everywhere. And that will make things so much easier because yes, it's for me, it's very difficult to talk to, uh, to, to have some kind of relationship or, 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 you know, any even small talk with, with a woman over there who believe is, is a strong believer in these strict gender roles. Yeah. I was, I was actually going to, you know, that's a good point too. Um, that, you know, masculinity and fem, you know, the feminine like qualities are very common um, over there. I've noticed that just with how Russian women present themselves, they dress very, you know, I mean, traditional, like they're very beautiful. I mean, they very much take care of themselves. So I believe that kind of goes into that mentality that they want to be, make sure they're the feminine ones there. They want to be the female. They want to be there for the guy and want that guy to be masculine. Um, I was going to say with regards to the Western values for women there, I think, especially I'm sure you would find that more in Moscow or St. Petersburg, I would assume than you would find in any other rural city where they're probably a lot more traditional for the most part. Um, you know, kind of going back to the topic of money too, you know, with regards to the women there, that's kind of something that's another, yet another stereotype that people kind of bring up in Western countries that if you're with a Russian woman, um, all they want is either your green card or they want your money or whatnot. How true does that actually hold over there in Russia? Uh, let's let, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can really accurately say it, but sure. I, I want, I want to say 50% true, mm -hmm. but it's, I'm probably exaggerating. It's probably 25% true, but even 25% true is really, it's pretty high, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're like Russian people joke about that too. Like, Oh, American guy, you'll find a Russian girl easily. She wants to go to America. Yeah. And and like, I've, I've had that situation happen to me so many times. Some girl will know, like, she'll know that I'm married, but she'll still come up to me and be like, Chris, can you introduce me to one of your American friends? I have to get out of this country. Wow. And, that's crazy. Um, and, and sometimes they'll even present it as a business deal. They'll say, hey, how much do I need to pay for one of your friends to fake marry me and help me get documents? Wow. And so like, um, it's, a prevalent, it's a prevalent idea. People know that, they, that there's an opportunity there and uh it's people aren't very discreet about it yeah i i would assume again kind of going back to the major cities like moscow st petersburg that's probably less likely although i will say that even in those big cities a lot of russian women are are very much wanting to get out and move to either europe or united states or whatnot because i think a lot of it also has to come down to the economy the the money the income that they're making you know i think it's just yeah. a lot lower than they can make here in america and florida as we both live in we you know we have a pretty sizable russian and growing russian community here Absolutely. and you know a lot of them do get married and come down not saying that they just come here and then they leave their husband and go off and do what they want because i've seen plenty of russian women that are here that um you know are happily married and they just genuinely wanted to get out of their country but they were also very happy being in the relationship they were in yeah, so I think that's absolutely. important to mention. I absolutely thank you, thank you. I wanted to I wanted to also bring that up that um, you know it's fun to talk about the stereotypes and it's fun to to talk, to, to to try to generalize about an entire nation of people, but mm -hmm. um, but honestly, there are a lot of really really great 
young women, young people, and 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 people in general in, in Russia um, who don't even who would never think about that stuff, would never think about doing that shady, underhanded stuff to people because uh, it's just not in their belief. Like, I would say that one of the things that surprised me the most is how many people believe in karma. Yeah, and they really believe in it like not not in the way that like oh you know if i i don't want to do something bad because it'll come back but thinking like that 100 will happen yeah um they, they have a phrase they say um everything comes back like a boomerang oh, okay I, um, I, I thought i heard boomerang in there some russian words have like an english kind of you can yeah yeah. It. yeah so um that so so on that note i mean people really try not to give themselves bad karma and of course. there's a lot of people who i mean russian people are really really smart too yes uh, absolutely so and and on the note of the the negative the negative ideas associated with specifically russian women around money mm-hmm. um you know we have this idea in english and in the united states of a gold digger yep and for russian people when the woman acts like this that's not really the, the stereotype we don't they don't think like oh she just wants to get his money and run they look at it as she's going after opportunity and she's ambitious and um let, let me put it this way frame it a little differently yeah uh if your whole life like it, my whole life is about teaching english and how and businesses related to teaching and so like if that's what my whole life is about i'm going to be focused on that. And, and that's my career. If your whole life is about being beautiful, then being beautiful is your career. And you could, can, you could think of it as by being, by striving to be as beautiful as possible and having the best career in this sphere that you're trying to get the highest salary that you can and be as successful as you can in this line of work. Um, so this is another way that you might think about the connection between beauty and, and money that a person tries. It's like a professional athlete. Yeah. Uh, they have, you know, 10 years to in their prime to, to, to do what they're going to do and they want to get the most out of it. Of course. Yeah. That's a great point, man. Um, I, you know, I kind of want to just briefly touch upon, um, you know, with regards to the money situation in Russia, usually when you have, you know, a more rough economy with less money, you also have sometimes increased crime too. And in, in, in some of these more poor countries in Russia, I don't think is any exception with regards to safety, you know, compared to, to one of the major cities like Moscow or St. Petersburg or one of the other more rural towns or cities that you've been in. Have you ever once in your eight years living there felt very unsafe in a situation or have you been in a situation where you were in danger or very possibly could have been in danger? I have, I have, uh, several, but you know, I like to think of it as I was there for eight years, so I had to experience something. Um, but the, I like to, I like to use Russian, uh, pagavorki sayings. Um, you know, (laughs) there's a Russian saying that, uh, like, if you find yourself in a bad situation, it's probably because you put yourself there. I was going to mention that too. and, And I think that that's absolutely true about my bad situations. Um, for the most part, I never had any problem, anything, but, but, you know, sometimes there were those situations, uh, to answer directly, I feel safer in most Russian cities than I do in most American cities. Uh, and many people say that American and Russian when they have experienced both, because here in the States, everybody's armed. Yep. I mean, a lot of people are armed at least. And over there, if the person's armed, it's probably just, uh, they call it a pneumatic pistol, like an air, air pistol. Um, they can, sure, they can hurt you, but they're, you know, it's harder for you to die from this. So, of course. so I did have a situation like that where uh, somebody pointed one at me and basically said that I needed to, they were, they were drunk and they, they hit me with their car. <laughs> Mm. And so uh, I got up and and walked across the street and he got out of his car and he pointed it at me and told me to give him money to fix his car. And I basically told him, you know, I'm not going to give you money for hitting me and walked away. And he called his friends 
they came over and they stomped us out on the ice. Wow. And, uh, I call, I heard him call his friends. So I called one of mine and Whoa. they came with their car and jumped in the car. And the guys were like holding onto the car while we were driving away, kicking the side of the car. So, wow. That's like yeah, the that most was... Russian thing I've ever heard. Holy shit. <laughs> they have their vodka <laughs> bottles. <soon. laughs> uh, so like, that's uh, wild. That, was on the, that was on the main, the main street of the city, Lenina street. So, um, and what, what city was this in? Yekaterinburg. Wow. Yekaterinburg. Some real but, true Russian Gopniks. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there were, there were, you know, that was probably the most extreme one. There were a couple other situations where, you know, yeah. there was some kind of fight and, uh, but, but again, of course. in all of those situations, like I could have easily recognized the signs that something was coming and, and made some different decisions. And, um, like, for example, the last one, a couple of years ago when I was visiting, uh, I just went into a shop to buy a bottle of like rum or something with my friend who I was, I was at his house. We just walked over to the shop. And uh, when we came out of it, the, so there was two guys, they were clearly drunk. And, um, and I, I keep giving these examples, but most people are not drunk, but of these course, guys were clearly. Of course, yeah. So everybody could tell. Uh, Usually where the danger is going to lie is people are yeah, drunk piani. Those are the same exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, or you know, another word you can say, buhi. Buhi. Uh huh. Uh-huh, because okay. Pete is just to drink, but buhi is like to drink a lot of alcohol. Ah, okay. Okay. To get drunk. Yeah. Uh, buhi. Piani buhi. Yeah. Piani so buhi. they were definitely uh, buhi. <laughs> yeah. Very. Ochin. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so they heard us uh, speaking English to each other. And when we went outside, one guy asked my friend for a cigarette. My friend said, no, I don't have any. And the guy got offended. Wow. He was looking for a reason to get offended, of course, but he got offended. And so he follows us. He starts to tell my friend how he's going to kick his ass or something. And, and I mean, in the end, nothing happened. We just kind of backed into the shop again. And the people in the shop were like, Hey, you, we, like we see you every day. We know where you live. Like get out of here. Oh, they told and, that to the drunk guys. The yeah, people shop. Yeah. yeah, because I mean, we came in there, spent money like normal people, and they're causing trouble. Of course. So, like, um, so so I mean, in most situations, nothing like that is ever going to happen. But yeah, I've had my fair share of rough situations too. Okay. Wow. Yeah. No. I mean, uh, but I, you know, I think that's important to bring that up for, um, you know, people who are very interested, not just visiting, but more particularly living, because there can very well, like as you mentioned, but in eight years, you know, to only be in kind of just a few situations, you know, comparatively, yeah. if you were in a major city here in the U.S., where God knows what would happen, especially um, as you mentioned, everybody's armed. Um, Anything can really happen, man. I I absolutely agree with you that I would definitely feel more unsafe um, being in some major cities here in the U.S. than I would be in, you know, rural Russian cities because you never know what's going to happen here. So I'm glad that you bring that up, that it is quite rare that, you know, something like that is going to happen. So, yeah, that's a great point, man. Um, I forgot what I was just about to ask, too. I was about to ask something. Oh, yeah. Okay. So for people who who are, you know, going back to the actual teaching situation, for people who are interested in in, in teaching English abroad in Russia, um, I I personally went out of my way to try to go online and look for some, you know, links and pages. I try to go to Facebook and look for Facebook groups. I cannot seem to find anything. And maybe it's just me. I don't know. I don't know if anyone else that's watching this has tried, but it seems to be very hard to find a good, credible website or Facebook yeah. group or something to find ESL jobs in Russia, even though they have such a huge demand. Is there maybe a suggestion you can give me or to anybody else that's looking for a job that is interested? Obviously, particularly right now, I believe the borders are closed, but you know, in the near future when they are open and they're going to be at that huge demand of looking for teachers, what can you recommend for anyone watching? Yeah. Um, great. Great. So yeah, there's a, there's a website that everyone who's watching this, who's interested in going to Russia as a teacher or otherwise should know, or just talking to Russian people should know about, and that's Kontakte. How do you uh, spell that? It's, uh, so, so the web address is just vk.com. VK. Okay. VK.com. It used to be the full name and now it's just vk.com. Um, and contact it just means in contact uh so 
basically when, when I first went over there in 2009, uh, I, I had met some people in 2008 and I signed up on Contacte and it looked exactly like Facebook. Exactly. Just imagine Facebook 2008 and that's Contacte. Yeah. However, the cool thing about Contacte is that you have access to all movies, TV shows, songs, books, and files for free. In Russia. Now, Russia, yeah. Oh. Now, Russia has started, imagine going to Facebook and having access to all the intellectual property in the world for free. Um, that's what it was like. Now they've started cutting down on that and, and protecting the, the copyrights of authors and things. So it's a little less accept, um, accessible like that. But there's a cool thing there that you can basically just search by city for people who are interested in certain things. And you can find school owners of small schools in those cities and you can contact them directly. And, um, you know, I, I used to do consultations for people who had questions about getting ready to go to, to Russia. And, um, and this was the most common question. So this like is what I would tell them on those paid <laughs> consultations. I would tell them, go to uh, VK, type in these things in the search you know, just uh, English school in Saratov um, or Angliski v Moskve. And you're going to find a list of schools. And of course, because they're trying to promote themselves to students who are on this platform. Yeah. You can go there and in the groups on the right side, there's like contact pages or, or admin pages. And there, if you can, you can see which pages are the admin or the owners. So mm -hmm. you can click on that and send them a message. And it's either gonna be someone on their team or the owner th themselves. And this is a really good strategy if you don't have a four-year degree or if you don't have a CELTA or a TEFL or anything like that, because you're making like a personal connection with them, you directly reach out to them and you will stick out a lot more than just an application. Of course, yeah. Um, so I have heard of VK. I know it's also a popular um, app. I believe that's used a lot in Russia too. Um, I and I, I keep comparing this to China, but I know it's comparative to WeChat, I believe. So I think this is how like a lot of people in China get jobs through WeChat too. So I kind of forgot yeah. about VK's existence up until you just mentioned it again. But um, I, I guess that is a really good point. Like if you do want to get a teaching job out there and you're not sure where else to look. Um, that's actually a really good point that he brings up is using VK, um, like the website, or I assume you could probably do the same thing from the app, right? Or is it only through the website? It's, not, it's, it's like WeChat in the way that everybody uses it. It's not like WeChat in the way, in the limitations of WeChat. Like it, it's more like Facebook. Similar um, to Facebook. Okay. It's more like Facebook. So, so the app and the web version are practically the same. And, uh, yeah, you, you can connect with anybody you want. You don't have to be have special connections to get to groups or to get to to different people. Um, so you can just go in there and go into the search and find anyone and everyone. I was gonna say, um, with the increased demand, you know, um, you you're basically saying you can find jobs from almost anywhere in Russia right now. That's looking for teachers, I assume, right? Yeah, and and honestly the pandemic probably made them more desperate. So, yeah. uh, and there are flights like just two days ago, a guy flew from Yekaterinburg to Tampa to visit. Oh, okay. And, Did not know that. Uh, you just go through Turkey instead, or you just go through somewhere else, you know, like, so they, <laughs> there's always a way around it. Does, does Russia support, um, you know, obviously if you're getting the visa, I believe your employer, as you mentioned before, can, um, support your, your visa. Did they support, I know, and again, I hate, I hate to keep comparing China, but do they support your flight slash accommodation as well? I know certain jobs in China, for example, they would actually su even support your accommodation. They would actually have, if you work for a specific employer, they would even support your accommodation. Is there any job like that in Russia too? That's like that. So if you work for the big companies, then that's going to be a standard uh, compensation package that you've just described. Oh, okay. If you work for a smaller company, then you're probably going to lose some of those benefits. Yeah. Um, like, for example, our company, we typically what's going to happen, you pay for all your expenses before you come. Mm -hmm. Once you're on the ground, then they'll start paying the visa expenses and they'll start paying the, uh, you know, th they'll have some kind of end of contract flight reimbursement. Yeah. 
So like in my company, that's what we did. We had an end of contract bonus, which was meant to partially not fully reimburse the plane tickets, but in other companies, they fully reimburse them. Um, but this is dependent upon you completing the entire contract yep. because yep. it's not worth it to the company if you're only there for like a month, you know? Which I'm sure, you know, does happen um, in a lot of jobs, even in like Vietnam where I was living, there was a high turnover rate. So, you know, contracts were... Um, you know, becoming more common to try to mitigate that and to add, you know, extra bonuses, as you were mentioning. So um, I'm not sure what kind of like turnover rate was in Russia to how it was out there. But, um, you know, that I know that that was kind of sometimes an issue, especially for less, you know, demand jobs or uh, less paying jobs. Um, yeah. So with regards to those, you know, that package that you were, you were explaining with the reimbursement or accommodation or whatnot, um, is that for people that still have those baseline qualifications if they have like a, just a TEFL certification or whatnot too, right? You're yeah. Nodding, yeah. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Like the, the negative side of having a visa that's sponsored by a company is that they have you by the balls. Yeah. Um, yeah. As the you were positive mentioning. side, the positive side is that they have to take care of you. Of course. So, um, so, so like if, if you're just homeless wandering around getting in trouble or, or, you know, someone from the government notices this, then that company will have problems. Um, hmm. If you if you don't have a flight out and you're going and your visa is going to run out, <clears throat> then the company technically is supposed to come in and you know get you the ticket and send you on your way. Um, so like there are some weird things like that. I would never I, I would never advise you to to put the company in that position because there's it's their home turf and they're going to find a way to to make it advantageous for them. But, but they need to take care of you to a certain extent. And, um, and that's, that's good because your, their name is in your visa. Of course. So, so if anything goes wrong, they're going to come back and looking for that company. Like we had one guy who he went out and had too much fun one night and he got beat up, wow. <laughs> got into a fight and his he lost fault. his, he lost his, uh, he lost his American passport with visa oh, and everything. That's rough. That's really um, rough. But luckily, this old woman called us the next day and said, hey, I found an American passport laying on the street. Wow. And I found your business card in it. Wow. And so. Um, Incredibly so, lucky. You know, yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, when he went to the police station and all of this was reported, then they call us and they say, hey, why is your person at the police station? And. So, you know, all the questions come back to the company. So this is another reason why I'm really happy to be out of that business. But of course, but, but of course from, from the perspective that you're bringing, it, it's great that people still do that to, to provide that, op, that opportunity to people who want to work and travel there. Yeah, but I, I think that's important though that, you know, people who are going to teach abroad need to understand, particularly from Western countries like here in the U.S., you know, you need to understand that these, I've even noticed in Vietnam, they don't abide by the same laws that we're used to here in the United States. They have yeah. control over what they want to do. Um, again, going back to, to the China situation, and I think you said this was the same kind of um, situation in Russia. If they want to let you go, they'll just fire you, probably for any reason, I assume. I don't know if the laws are a little different in Russia, that they have to have more reasoning to to let you go or if there's any more legality but i know like china for example or even probably in vietnam they could just fire you for whatever reason if you they could fire you for something as petty as as your skin tone i know uh, i've heard horror stories in china though where you know african people or people that are darker than us would they would say that they claim that they scare scare children and they would just fire them for that or they wouldn't hire them for that reason do you notice any kind of discrimination issues that occur there in Russia too, when it comes to teaching? Absolutely. Yeah. There, there's discrimination. Um, if you ask a Russian person in Russia about diversity, they're going to tell you the, this line that the president always says, Russia is a multinational nation mm -hmm. or multicultural nation. Um, and when they say multicultural, multi multinational, what they mean is, Uzbek, Kazakh, Tajik, Tatar, Russian, <clears throat> Ukrainian. This is what the uh, Armenian, Caucasian. That, that's this is what they're talking about. You know, yeah. in the United States, we usually mean people from things that are officially other countries and were not the former USSR. You know what I mean? Like, but but for them, this former USSR was so big and so so many different people were were there that 
this constitutes a type of multicultural, multinational environment. However, similar to other developed countries, you have uh, poorer countries that, that provide a workforce for a black market kind of economy. Uh, so, so in the United States, someone might say that that's Mexico and, and most of Central America, whereas in Russia, this is what they call the CIS countries, the, the, the Central Asian countries of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, um, and, and those, that area, uh, Kyrgyzstan also. And, and so people are discriminate, people are very blatantly, what we would say in the United States, it, racist against those people in Russia. Mm -hmm. They're definitely seen as like a second, second class citizens, as like a work workforce, um, and you get that, you get that from the beginning and, of course. and, uh, but, but then when we talk about Westerners, like Westerners are also foreigners, non-Russian foreigners, but Westerners have this kind of automatic respect from Russians. Like it, it, they, I don't know why, but, but this is kind of how they, they act. And if you're African-American or if you're from Africa, um, you know, a lot of the African guys I knew from like Nigeria, Zambia, who, who were there, they always were upset a little bit when Russian people trying to be politically correct would call them African-American. They're like, what are you, I'm just African, not American. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but there is some discrimination there also. Um, anyone who has a, an Asian appearance, Russians tend, tend to call them Chinese. Doesn't matter where they're from, they're just Chinese. Uh, and Anybody who is black, for lack of a better word, uh, they call African American. And however, being that, like we had a guy working for us who was from Atlanta, like he was a super tall guy, long dreads. Mm -hmm. He stood he stood out like a sore thumb in, in in Russia, but he spoke better Russian than I did, and he had a he he actually got a bachelor's degree in teaching Russian from a Russian university. That that is awesome, uh, actually. That yeah. is super cool, man. And so he'd be walking down the street and sometimes people would just come up and say, Hey, I want to take a picture with you. And so, you know, the first month or so that was really cool. And, and the novelty factor, but after like two, three years of being there, he was just kind of like, Oh my God, why people need to stop <laughs> doing this, you know? Um, but I also had this situation where uh, we were shooting a music video and he was in it. And um, this old grandpa, old guy, he just came out, he came around the corner with his groceries in his hand. He takes a look up at him and he goes, oh my God, don't scare me like that. Wow. So kind of the same thing that you're describing in, in China where someone might feel that that's actually appropriate to, to react like this, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there's not a lot of, let's say that, that political correctness is not a big thing in Russia. Yeah, and that definitely goes back to, you know, how the government is, um, you know, how people were raised in the country. Um, and I think the the concept of is particularly going back to African-Americans or Africans, you know, uh, being darker skin, they definitely get a lot more attention, whether it's positive or negative. I noticed this in Asia alone, too. My friend, uh, this is Ace Live, another really well-known YouTuber growing really quick, actually, when he's out in Vietnam. Every time me and him will walk together out in the streets he always got way more attention than me. It was always positive energy, of course, but I was like, man, I was like, this guy is getting so much energy from, uh, you know, positive energy from everybody. And I actually was like super humbled that most people were very friendly. Um, and, and I, I want to, you know, use your, um, you know, example there for maybe someone who is African, African American, who wants to live in Russia that, you know, um, that you should expect this because in Asia, this does happen too. there is going to be negative situations, uh, more particularly for you guys, because just because of your skin tone. And I don't think that should directly, I think you should just, I don't know. I think you should keep an open mind when it comes to that stuff too, because you, you know, it's not the same way it is here in Western western culture especially in the united states if somebody said something like that here in the united states as we already have seen in this year alone um it goes really badly so yeah. um i think it's important that you bring that point up that you know um they are going to be treated differently being abroad whether it's and positive that, or negative. and i think that it's actually an opportunity a lot of people i've seen this happen over there a lot that they've used it to their advantage the guy that for my example, yeah, he actually had a traveling band where he's American, but um, with 
two or three other guys who were from Congo and from Nigeria. They had they traveled around Russia. Companies would pay for them to come and perform at like their corporate events and stuff. And they would travel around Russia and play African music. And this guy who I told you about was the vocalist. And um, so like they built a business and they built a, a music group and a following from this. And, and it's not only about people who are really dark skinned. Uh, it's, it's anybody who is different and you are different as a foreigner going over there. You can use that to your advantage. And, of course. and I really like, thank you for bringing me on here to, to talk about this today because like, I built a whole brand around that. I built a brand called Chris Americos and Americos is a derogatory word for an American person. It's when I tell people that that's the brand name, Russian people are like, what, why, oh, why, why do you call yourself that? Yeah. And so like, it sticks out in their mind that I'm different, that I'm that guy. I'm not Russian, even though this word is Russian, I'm not Russian, I'm, I'm the American guy, right? And so you can make yourself that person and use that to your advantage. And I feel like by doing that, by leaning into that pressure or leaning into that uh, discrimination or whatever you wanna call it, that I really got, I really got a huge benefit out of that. Um, so the fact that someone doesn't like you or, or says something wrong, uh, rude about you, that can be a big, a really big plus, um, you know, and it doesn't always have to be white, black. Like uh, I, I lived in Hawaii for three years and in Hawaii, everyone called me Howley, which is white person and Howley. <laughs> yeah. And so that was really the first time that I felt some kind of discrimination in, in my life because <clears throat> most of the people were either Hawaiian, giant, Japanese, Japanese, Chinese, or Samoan. And mm -hmm. uh, white people were just kind of like these people who shouldn't be on our island. <laughs> and yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's, it's interesting to think about that. Yeah, that's a great point, man. Well, um, I just want to say thank you for, you know, all the information that you've given me, you know, throughout this yeah, no this interview because again there's so much it seems like there's so much lack of information about you know the mysteries of russia and to be able to just get you know your first-hand perspective of what it's actually like to be out there but not only out there but teaching what teaching is like being out there for eight year eight plus years i mean that's a long time to get to truly know what a country is like that that so many people still know little about it seems like um if you know just kind of recap you know everything we talked about if there's any information that you can give people as to what they should prepare if they're planning on going out to live abroad how much money do you think somebody should save and all the other main documents that you were kind of mentioning at the beginning what's kind of the main key things that somebody should have whenever they're preparing to move from here to to rush to teach yeah, after they've exactly. secured a job of course yeah so, right, you get a job, you have to have an official job offer. This means a signed contract. Um, and the signed contract in Russia will be in Russian. That's the one that counts in Russia. So whatever the English contract says, it doesn't actually matter. But anyways, I digress. Uh, so you'll have a signed contract and the company has to make um, a work visa invitation which is sent directly to the embassy or consulate in your home country where you're going to apply for your work visa. Uh, so as far as money you need to save, you need to save several thousand dollars. If you're going to go to some small rural area, then that I would suggest, you know, at the very least a thousand dollars. I would suggest two or three, definitely. If you're going to go to Moscow, St. Petersburg, I'd probably say more five, six, seven. I mean, just to be on the just to be on the safe side. Absolutely. If you if you go over with five grand, you're golden, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, but to be prepared for going for coming to Russia, forget all the stereotypes. Don't be scared, and have a plan. Have a goal of what you want to get out of it. Um, you know, I'm not the first person in history to go to Russia and find something really lucrative and find something really interesting. Uh, there's lots of stories of people do it. Maybe, you know, a guy named Tony Robbins, he has a few bucks. He, he also did this. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so, so go with a plan, have a goal about what you want to get out of it and, and just keep going for that. If you, if you want to get into bad situations, you're going to, and if you want to get into good ones, you, you will too. And, um, there's so many people who are going to help you. 
there's so much positivity. So focus on the positive and don't be afraid and don't be scared. And just because people don't smile, it doesn't mean anything, anything bad. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thank you, Chris. Any closing remarks to anybody, um, you know, watching yeah, this sure. that maybe you'd want to let them know um, about yeah. Russia in general or just traveling in general even? Uh, I mean, just remember that it's different. Like, um, I remember when I first, when I first went over there, I first got the job in the big company and I was going through the training with some other Americans and I was listening to Russian music on the, on the bus ride. And the girl, American girl with me, she's like, um, like, are you going to become Russian? And I was like, well, I want to a little bit. And she's like, oh, I don't, I want to be like, I want to learn about Russia, but I'm always going to be American. And for me, it was kind of a strange um, idea that you wouldn't make yourself open to be, to being changed by the culture, by being changed by the, the country that you're going to, especially if you're going to live there for a decent amount of time. Um, let it change you. Like, people change. Change is natural. And, mm -hmm. and you're going to get something that so many people don't get by having that experience. So allow yourself to be changed. That's, that would be my biggest piece of advice. So, um, you know, Brian, thanks so much. If anybody wants to reach out, I'll just give the rundown of my Absolutely. stuff that's going on. Uh, if anybody made it this far in the video, then they probably, yeah, they were obviously interested. interested. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I, so I have a program where I coach teachers on how to start and grow their own teaching business. And our website is teachingrevolution.com, teaching-revolution.com. Uh, we have a free seven day trial training, so you can start there and see if you like it. Um, I also have a website for students. We have, uh, in the last year, we've got about 11,000 new students. And wow. this business did uh, so far this year, $1.1 million in revenue. That's incredible. And so um, you can go check out what that kind of business might look like. And that's chrisamericos.com. Um, I also have a business where we teach English to Spanish speakers, which is we-speak-english.com. And we've just recently launched our rushintorussian.com website for teaching Russian to English speakers. So, um, so if you're interested in any of that stuff, feel free to go check it out on those websites. There's, there's always free stuff that you can try before making any kind of commitment or, or doing anything like that. But, um, but other than that, you should definitely keep watching Brian's videos because he finds some interesting people to interview. Thank you. And it's like a window into the rest of the world. So, uh, Brian, thanks so much for doing these. Hey, thank you very much, Chris. And, uh, yeah, it, to his point, like he was mentioning, I'm always looking for opportunities to, to interview interesting people from around the world. And Chris was one of the first people I, I actually saw when I was looking up how to teach in Russia. The very, one of the very first links I clicked on actually on Google his video popped up on there, which was incredible. So obviously I looked at his channel and he had amazing uh, information surrounding his life out in Russia. So Chris, thank you so much again for coming on the channel. Thank you everybody who's watched up to this point. Uh, it means a lot. And um, I guess in Russian, Das Vidanya. Спасибо. Thanks everybody. <laughs>